Hello everyone and thank you for joining me for a March W13 Fine Dining Review and this evening marks an exciting milestone, our first review of a three Michelin starred establishment or at least it was rated as such the last time a Michelin guide was published for Las Vegas. Yes, we are dining at Guy Savoie at the world famous Caesars Palace on the Las Vegas Strip. Guy Savoie of course is a celebrity chef who owns several renowned restaurants in Paris but his flagship is the one bearing his name and its Las Vegas sister outpost Guy Savoie is the one we'll be patronizing this evening. So please stick with me, you won't be disappointed. And the entryway as you can see here is nothing terribly exciting but there is a wall lined with uh, some of the most exquisite wines in the world. And the modern design elements of this amazing dining room include plates from uh, Design Your Virginia Mo, which can be purchased from the Guy Savoie Boutique for around 300 euros a piece. And from our vantage point here on the second floor of the Augustus Tower in Caesar's Palace, we have some incredible views of Vegas landmarks like the Flamingo. But our first amuse-bouche of the evening consists of a wee bit of foie gras topped with a gelée. It's a sort of classic combination of rich, creamy, sweet foie gras enriched with the saccharin gelée. It may not be terribly original, but it was certainly a nice and luxurious way to start a wonderful meal. And what may pass as table decor at first glance turns out to be vessels for distributing fresh black pepper and fleur de sel for the table. And next arrives the bread cart. And I did uh, partake in the pageantry of the bread cart after having rejected the champagne cart. And I chose uh, several slices, which uh, we'll review here in a moment. Now the butter is truly special. It originates from the coast of Brittany and it arrives unsalted but can be integrated with the fleur de sel for a uh, beautifully seasoned product. Now as for the selections from the bread cart, I'll briefly explain what was on my plate. The cherry pecan bread was just what you'd expect with intense but fresh cherry flavor. The pecans are a bit sparsely distributed and just seem out of place to me. The multi-grain fennel was equally self-explanatory. The gritty texture of grain was complemented by strong fennel buds bursting with flavor with just a hint of honey. The lemon bread was surprisingly sweet with candied lemon notes distributed throughout, finishing like a lemon poppy seed cake. And the rosemary bread was just so herbaceous and savory, it was lovely with the butter from Brittany. Next came what I suppose was the principal amuse-bouche, which was a watermelon gelée with pancetta, fresh fruit, and feta cheese. This was a truly whimsically exciting bite that gave the impression of a slushy drink, combining the salty, smoky pancetta with the subtly sweet freshness of watermelon. The buttery, tangy feta cheese further elevated what was in the end not a terribly adventurous dish, but just plain good. Sort of Colula caviar, langoustine jolie underneath. The three little pouch are called Aumonier, inside the tartare of cucumber, green apple, and tarragon. Then in green, the cucumber, green apple puree, in orange, grapefruit puree. Then we're just going to call steam it with what we call the citrus kefir lamb water to enhance the natural citrus flavor of the dish. Bon appétit, monsieur. Merci bien. Mm. So beneath all the smoke and citrusy perfume of this dramatic presentation, the first official course 
consisted of langoustine with caviar and grapefruit and cucumber. The langoustine was exquisite, but the caviar really accentuated its fishier notes, and in the end it somehow seemed a bit under-seasoned. The first pour of the night was a 2006 Piper Heidesek Rare Brut Milzim. This is a Chardonnay and Pinot Noir based champagne and it's the 10th time since 1976 that they produced it. Initial impressions were a classic champagne bouquet of toasted brioche and stone fruit. I found it eminently sippable on its own and with quite refreshing acidity. It was a bit more fresh than other champagnes, though still velvety and full bodied. This champagne goes for around $170 a bottle. But back to the langoustine after the smoke cleared, the citrus, as I would find in other dishes this evening, certainly added some fine dining flair, but I was ambivalent as to its ultimate suitability to this dish, which was quite perfumey, but tamed or at least complemented somewhat by the champagne, which I found to be a successful pairing overall. The next glass was filled with the 2016 Alex Gamble Melso from Burgundy. 2016 was apparently a difficult year for Burgundy, hit hard by frost and mildew. The Clos du Comin was particularly affected, the result being a 60% reduction in yield and wines with hints of gunflint on the palate. It has an almost burnt rubber bouquet layered atop the classic Chardonnay notes. I detected some brioche as well from this medium to full body Chardonnay, which finished slightly less bitterly than others of its kind. And that was paired with the second course of the night, which consisted of a sea bream with beautifully crisp skin, cooked perfectly inside and out and swimming in the luxuriously buttery juices of the sea, and complemented nearly perfectly by the milky textured Chardonnay pairing. The cooked vegetables were superbly tender, while the slaw-like salad added some much needed acidic freshness, although I found it a bit heavy-handed on the green apple. The artichoke and black truffle soup has been a Guy Savoie signature dish for over three decades. The soup is intriguing in its simplicity and naturally velvety but somewhat more watery texture than appearances would suggest given the total absence of cream in this dish. So it derives its texture presumably primarily from the silkiness of the artichoke puree. The freshly shaped truffles which were quite vegetal in flavor are surprisingly subdued and well integrated in their infusion throughout the soup. And the little pockets of cheese were also a nice surprise. I thought the toasted mushroom brioche, which was not overly buttery, complemented the soup well, but something about it just seemed as though it was trying a bit too hard. Now, the wine was a transition from white to red. This is the 2012 Henri Boyot, a 100% Burgundy Pinot Noir, which was unique in several dimensions, unusually dark in color and not as acidic or as light-bodied as most Pinots. It was aromatically herbaceous with notes of dried fruit and tobacco. On the whole, I found it reminiscent of many Italian wines, and I believe this one typically goes for somewhere in the $100 to $120 range per bottle. And as we view a plating of selections from the cheese cart at the adjoining table, I'll simply add that uh, the dark oaky Pinot Noir paired perfectly and added a delightfully smoky element to the uh, artichoke and black truffle soup. And as it goes, I think without saying, the service at this restaurant is impeccable. And now for the main event, the Sealand course of A5 Japanese Wagyu beef with lobster, tortellini, carrot, and coral jus. Obviously a take on classic surf and turf. The Kobe is just what you'd expect, crispy on the outside, a beautifully marbled medium rare on the inside. The lobster is sublime, accompanied harmoniously by the velvety sweet sauce and complex but light and delicate carrot tortellini. It was a stunningly composed dish balancing perfectly both sweet and spicy elements, although some parts of the lobster were just a touch rubbery. All in all, a very impressive package. 
And the pairing was particularly special, a 20-year-old left bank Bordeaux from saint Estef, a 2001 Chateau Montrose to be exact. This wine goes for around $160 a bottle these days. It was surprisingly floral and tobacco-y on the nose. Although spicy and quite astringent, I found it an extremely sippable medium-bodied wine. The age brings that fortified nuttiness and concentration, and I detected hints of candied cherry on the palate. And now my turn for the cheese cart, and I selected two hard Italian cheeses, two semi-soft cheeses, and a blue cheese. And as expected, these cheeses were delectable, but nothing transcendent, particularly if you were accustomed to cheese courses in France, or perhaps on your transoceanic premium class flights. And accompanying the supplemental cheese course, a Madeira wine called Baltimore Rainwater, despite its Spanish provenance, was served. As the name might suggest, it was indeed a bit watered down, but otherwise a rather standard port wine with nutty sweetness and caramel notes. A brief pre-dessert intermezzo consisted of a palate-cleansing apple sorbet with a crumble. The sorbet was unexpectedly spicy with highly perfumed cherries. In the end, it achieved its palate-cleansing purpose in a unique and different way. The dessert course would be paired with a Chateau Couté, which was essentially a watered-down sauterne from Balzac. I say watered-down, but it was really rather pleasantly light, lacking in the syrupy viscosity of many sauterne, giving way to even juicier peach and apricot flavors. And the dessert course itself was essentially a deconstructed gourmet chocolate bar on steroids. One element tasted of sweet burnt popcorn, another pure chocolate, and another of popcorn ice cream. Combined, these elements made for the best caramel popcorn cracker jack snack imaginable, and the dessert wine with its caramel undertones elevated the dish in all of its icy, crunchy, chocolatey goodness. And just as I finished the dessert course, yet another cart, this one loaded with yet more desserts, arrived. Offering a variety of sweet delights, I selected an oh-so caramelly flan, which paired perfectly with the dessert wine, a chocolate mousse, which was rich but far from decadent, a crusty marshmallow, and a freshly baked cherry cake made with homemade love and a delightfully light rice pudding. I capped it all off with one serious cappuccino, deeply roasted with meringue-like foam, and so hot it was nearly scalding, but very satisfying. And just one final act, a palate cleansing sorbet with black pepper, the perfect way to end the evening. So in the end, what did I think? Well, with the 2020 death of Joao Bouchon and the now questionable future of his Las Vegas restaurants at the MGM Grand, along with the likely permanent closure of Twist by Pierre Gagnier at the Waldorf Astoria in City Center, Guy Savoie remains really the last of its kind, offering a decadent multi-course, three Michelin star quality tasting menu with premium wine pairing. It's certainly not cheap, and it's far from modern Vegas. In fact, it's just about as traditional as traditional fine dining gets with the tuxedo-clad waiters, the champagne, cheese, and dessert carts. It's not old Vegas, but it is old world and classic fine dining, and it seems to be something that a post-pandemic Vegas may transition away from. 
So if you're looking for absolute perfection in food, service, and wine, and you have the budget to accommodate the Forbes five-star tasting menu with premium wine pairing, I cannot express in words the magnitude of my endorsement for a visit to Guy Savoy on your next trip to Vegas. On the other hand, there wasn't a single dish or glass of wine that necessarily distinguished itself as a top five experience for me, but in the end, the totality of the experience was essentially flawless. And you receive this lovely parting gift upon exiting, which is quite a bit more substantial than the Mignardis that uh, you may have received previously. Well, that's about all for this fine dining review. Thanks for joining me, and I hope you can join me next time for the next March W13 Hotel.